good morning. good morning and welcome to Asylum Hill Congregational Church, an open and affirming community in the United Church of Christ. We are thrilled and honored to connect with you and to worship God together. So welcome. Welcome to those of you who are live streaming this morning from different parts of the country and different parts of the world. We are thrilled you are able to connect with us. And I will just mention for those of you who are live streaming, uh, today we will be celebrating the Sacrament of Communion together later on in our service. So you might wanna make sure that you have some elements uh, to uh, commune with. Uh, a cup of coffee, a, a cup of juice, uh, whatever it is, um, and some bread of some kind. Also welcome to those of you who are catching our service later on in the week uh, via our YouTube channel. And welcome to those of you who are here at 814 Asylum Avenue. It is a joy to be able to be together and to worship our God in one another's presence. I would ask that everyone would take a moment, either now or uh, in the next hour or so, go to ahcc.org and sign in. Uh, while you are on our website, you can also send in a prayer request. Uh, this helps uh, us, your pastors, uh, know what is on your hearts and what is on your minds and how we can best lift you in prayer, not only today, but in our week as well. Also, please make sure that you are receiving our Friday email. Uh, if not, you can also sign up to receive that uh, weekly email on our website. A few announcements uh, this morning. Directly following worship, we invite everyone into a time of fellowship in Drew Hall. Uh, you can access Drew Hall by either door to the right or the left here up front um, of the sanctuary. And also following worship, um, Reverend Darrell Goodwin, um, our executive conference minister um, who is here with us uh, this morning and will bring us a good word uh, later on in the service. He will be uh, hosting a talkback session um, in Twitchell. So I would ask maybe get a cup of coffee, have a quick conversation, and then head into Twitchell to have some conversation with Darrell. Um, it will be a wonderful and joyful uh, conversation as always. Our 12 o'clock, uh, our free community meal will be taking place in our church parking lot. Um, and I just want to make sure, um, I want to make sure that all of you saw in our Friday email, there was a wonderful thank you uh, that went out to everybody. Um, this past um, Lenten season and Holy Week, so many of you, members, friends, volunteers, and staff, stepped up to bring such an amazingly rich and beautiful season as well as Holy Week. Um, if you were able to participate in any of it, then you recognize how sacred and holy the experience was. From pizza and puzzle nights uh, to the wandering heart of Peter, incredibly inspiring sermons and transe uh, transe transcendent Monday Thursday service um, with a labyrinth experience and the Good Friday Passion Concert, which left so many of us just absolutely in tears. Uh, to magical butterfly decorations made by our Faith Lab children for Easter Sunday. And the Easter Bunny. How many of you got your picture taken with the Easter Bunny last Sunday? Um, much, much ado, much ado was made about almost everything. Um, and I just want to make sure that we thank our staff and our volunteers and members and all of you who participated, because really it was what it was, because all of you um, were part of it in some way. So thank you, um, thank you. And if you thought we were gonna be taking a post-Easter break, think again. <laughs> uh, today we have as our guest preacher, uh, Reverend Darrell Goodwin. Um, as I said, Darrell is the Executive Conference Minister for the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ. Uh, he and his husband, Kenny, uh, have uh, dual membership here um, at Asylum Hill. 
Um, they were married here um, about a year and a half ago. Um, Darrell said that he still, even uh, this morning when he comes, uh, when he's driving to AHCC, he, he feels like he's coming for his wedding. And he kind of gets a little, uh, gets a little, <laughs> little anxious. <laughs> he said, I don't have to be anxious, it's already happened. We're already married. <laughs> a good anxiety, Kenny, a good anxiety. <laughs> But we are thrilled to have you uh, back with us and, um, and um, bring a w good word today. Next week, we will be celebrating Earth uh, Day with a special recognition and service. And the Climate Action Team will be hosting an Earth Day show and tell directly following service where you will be able uh, to hold and discuss uh, products and uh, actions we use to reduce waste and microplastics, uh, increase biodiversity, and save money and energy. Um, you're also uh, invited to bring um, your favorite way to reduce, reuse, and repurpose, uh, a way that you might want to share with others. The following Sunday, April 21st, and this is really, really important, um, April 21st will be Confirmation Sunday here at AHCC, uh, and we will have the incredible honor of confirming 21 young people um, into faith. I, I implore, and I actually will say that I expect, if I can do that, um, that anyone who can be here will be here. It's going to be an incredibly important service for us to show up and to show out for young people who are confirming their faith uh, publicly and want the generations to be a part of that. So April 21st, Confirmation Sunday, 21 young people. I implore and I expect all of you to be present. Um, and then... I want to remind you just uh, also of the annual women's retreat that is happening on beautiful Enders Island, which is a part of Mystic on the shore. That is happening at the end of the month, and there is uh, plenty of information uh, on our website uh, and registration materials for that. The Reverend Donna Minocchio will be leading that retreat, uh, and again, that is at the end of the month, so uh, please look into that. Jack has a quick announcement for us. Good morning. Just a very quick couple music and arts related things. At some point before you leave today, I want you to take a look at what has been on the art wall since January in Drew Hall, and that is the My New Year's Wish Is, and all the different things that are written on there. The intention was not to have it be up as long as it has, but there was something really amazing that happened three weeks ago when the Chopin competition was happening here by the Connecticut Chopin Foundation. There were 50 kids from all over the country and, and from all over the world who came for that competition on that Saturday. And if you look at the bottom half of the paper, you can tell that that's where most of the writing is because of how tall they are. Um, they took it upon themselves to write in different languages um, some amazing things on there. Please take some time to look at that. We are gonna take pictures of it to capture what, what was there, but it is, uh, there is amazing hope for the future just by reading that. Um, to piggyback on what Erica said about pizza and puzzle during Lent, we will be returning, whether it's pizza and puzzle or pretzels and puzzle or pie and puzzles, I don't know yet. <laughs> this will be, not this week, but the following Wednesday that will return. And one final shameless plug, our very own Shantice Shepherd, member of this church, soprano section leader for many years, is making her solo debut with the Hartford Symphony next, this next weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, in their, one of their Masterworks concerts. And I would just ask, if it's not on your calendar, would you please make it a point to go and support our beloved Shantice at the Bushnell? Thank you. And now, friends, I just take a look around. Move your head to the left and to the right. Look at those you are worshiping with. What an honor it is, right? What a privilege it is to be here together today. And then just take a deep breath. Let us settle into this place and this time of worship together. 
And as you are able, let us rise together in body or in spirit and be called into worship. Jesus said, follow me. Jesus said, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus said, forgive 70 times seven. Jesus said, feed my sheep. In response, we say, here's my heart, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Let us worship God with all our hearts. we have been called into worship. We have praised God with song. We are now called to recognize each other within each other the light of the risen Christ. For truly Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another. We come before our creator and expansive God in a time of prayer. We bring before the architect of eclipses and earthquakes, the resurrector and redeemer, all that we hold within our own hearts and the prayers we bring for our community, for the people we love, the people we don't know for the wor- and for the world. We hold fast to the afterglow of the Easter miracle, the empty tomb. We rejoice this morning with joy for several things. 
that I bring before you this morning. Our Faith Lab children, I, I, we, we wish to, to give our thanks to them and thank God for them. I don't know if any of you had a chance to look closely at the little butterflies and crosses that decorated the sanctuary uh, last Sunday, Easter Sunday, but they did a lot of work and uh, we are, appreciate that work and Pastor Jordan's uh, work encouraging them to be here and, and that we all love them. We thank God for them. We also thank God, as you heard earlier for, uh, from Reverend Erica, for the 29 confirmands uh, that will be confirmed on April 21st next week. Some, there's 21, that must mean something, so we've got to figure that out. But we give thanks to God for these young people who are committing their faith to God. We also pray for those in need of healing, in need of succor, comfort, whether it's broken relationships, illnesses, inequities, and oppression, justices. We especially lift up in our own community today the names of Haywood Alexander, Betty Cronin, Barbara Matthews, and Pamela Palmer as we pray for their well-being. And we ask God to grant that they and all those in the world who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit be recipients of God's healing love, strength, and courage. And now let us take a moment of silence to have our conversation with God about the things that are only between God and ourselves. God of victory over death, your son revealed himself again and again and convinced his followers of his glorious resurrection. Grant that we may know his risen presence in love, obediently feed his sheep and care for the lambs of his flock until we join the hosts of heaven in worshiping you and praising him who is worthy of blessing and honor. We especially pray for all those we've named aloud and in our hearts. And Lord, we pray with every ounce of our beings for all areas of conflict and suffering and war in this troubled world, that the eyes of all will be opened and recognize the risen Christ in our midst, and that we may be the hands and feet of Christ to bring about true peace and justice in this world. Remind us that the light of Christ, your Son, and our Savior shines eternally, and the darkness cannot overcome it. And grant to all of us living, Lord Christ, renewed faith, great courage, and your boundless peace. We pray all of this in the name of the risen Christ, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, I'm, I'm often not sure exactly um, how many of you um, know exactly um, what the United Church of Christ, the UCC, our denomination, um, the denomination that Asylum Hill Congregational Church is a part of, um, how much you know about that. Um, so I would say, uh, I want to just give you a, a really quick, uh, a quick tutorial. So our local UCC churches, like Asylum Hill Congregational Church, um, are part of associations. So we are part of the Hartford Association that is uh, a collective of other UCC churches in the Hartford area. Our associations are part of greater conferences. We are a part of the newly formed uh, Southern New England um, Conference of the United Church of Christ. So 
um, that is kind of, but then we also have uh, our conferences to come together under the umbrella of a national setting. So we do have a national UCC setting. Um, I am the spiritual leader of AHCC. Darrell uh, Goodwin is the spiritual leader of the Southern New England Conference. Uh, but then, as I said, we also have this entity, the UCC, on a, a national level that really shepherds our life together um, as a denomination throughout the nation and really the world at large. Um, today, we have um, the great fortune to have uh, a, a Reverend Andy DeBramer here. Um, Andy is actually part of um, the national setting of the UCC, which, in case anybody is wondering, our national setting, um, in case you ever want to make a trip, um, is in Cleveland. <laughs> so um, I, I've often thought- It's on everybody's bucket list. Yes. <laughs> Have a, have a seat, Andy. Um, so yes, uh, many people travel from uh, near and far to, um, to the UCC headquarters in Cleveland. Um, it's wonderful. But Andy is, um, as I said, part of the national setting, and he is um, one of our uh, folks who is in charge of philanthropy and stewardship team. Um, at the national setting, and he is with us today, and I would love um, to have a conversation with you about your work, Andy. Thank you for being here. Um, well, today. it's a pleasure to be here. Great. And you mentioned you and Darrell, and I also bring greetings from Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson, our General Minister and President. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I would love to know, um, Andy, what, what sort of motivates, or, or what do you do um, well, what do you do? Sure. Uh, we do help churches quite a bit with stewardship. So we produce stewardship theme materials that many of our churches use and other things like that. Okay. And then I raise money. That's, I mean, that's what I do. Uh, the director of philanthropy sometimes confuses people because it sounds like we give a lot of money away, which we do to have a lot of grant programs that help churches around the country. But primarily, uh, I'm on the fundraising side of that. And what motivates this work? When I was a local church pastor, we were gonna have a budget deficit we could see towards the end of the year. Surprise, right? <laughs> Shocker. Yeah, and one of our members came up to me and said, that's not gonna happen because no money, no mission. And we were passionate about our mission. So that's what motivates me at the national setting is our mission of a just world for all, united in Christ's love. I can work all day and night for a just world. And then what also motivates me is churches like Asylum Hill and our, our nearly 5,000 churches around the country that are doing incredible work. And so I want to thank you, thank you all for your ministry in this place and for your generosity to the national ministries of the United Church of Christ and the way that you support our collective work because we are stronger together that way. And can you, uh, right now, um, in the work that you're engaged in um, at the national setting, are, are there, um, is there a priority area um, that the UCC uh, national is, is really looking at um, in, in this moment in time? Yes, yes, very much so. We have a program called Join the Movement for Racial Justice. And uh, if you haven't heard of it or haven't seen it, you can go to jointhemovementucc.org. And there's an incredible uh, library of resources and so many stories of churches and people doing this, what I think is one of the most important, if not the most important work in, in our country, in our culture at this time. So alongside the programmatic work, we also have a fundraising campaign of $4 million, $2 million to do the work over the next few years, and $2 million for an endowment. Because we have the audacity to hope to believe that we can create a country that is that ends white supremacy, that is just around issues uh, of racial justice. Um, it's going to take more than a decade, more than 100 years probably, but we can do it. And so we need the support of everyone to uh, make that happen. Excellent. And and then can you name a couple of sort of the cutting edge or emerging ministry areas uh, that are happening right now in the UCC? 
Yeah, a couple come to mind. Uh, one is our harm reduction and overdose prevention ministries. We're actually the only mainline church that has a ministry to people who use drugs, all people who use drugs. Many of us sitting here are people who use drugs. And so how do we do that in a way that reduces harm, that gives the most life and prevents death? It's a program that literally saves lives. And the other one that comes to mind is um, we have a position at the United Nations, so not too far down the coast from, from you all. And the UN really came to us because they have a very active religious roundtable that informs their work and said, we need you, the UCC, with your unique justice voice in the United States at this table. So we uh, recently, over the past year, have a position, a person there doing that work, and then also bringing the work of the UN to us and our churches, especially around sustainable development goals. There's so much great work and so many great resources. Great, thank you. Um, and then I, I would just say, as you scan, um, as you kind of scan the, the UCC landscape, what, what is really, what's getting you most excited right now? Um, what gets me most excited is seeing churches like Asylum Hill that are active and figuring out how to be church in your community and the work we're doing around what does the church look like in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years. We have so many uh, communities and congregations that are, that are practicing new ways of being. And there's a church, I live in Michigan, uh, and there's a new church start there that is partnered with Habitat for Humanity in, in building homes around them, in particular to shelter not only folks and families that are homeless, but also uh, LGBTQ, I plus folks who, that's a conservative part of the country up there, uh, who are often kicked out of their homes. Um, and then the other piece that gets me excited is our global connections. We have partnerships across the world that go back decades and some centuries, and they're partnerships that are mutual, and as the world shrinks, we are learning so much from them, and they are enriching our life together, and that's exciting. Andy, thank you so much for being with us. Um, it is, it's just great for us. I think often we, we can become insular, um, and we can begin to think that we exist um, on our own and are not connected uh, to, to a larger uh, a body. And so it's wonderful to have you here. I, I thank you for coming um, and for just sharing some of the things that um, we are, you are excited about um, within our denomination. So thank you very pleasure. much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for all you do and the way you connect with us. Thank you very much. Friends, it is indeed a, a great gift. It's a gift to be together as a community of faith here at Asylum Hill Congregational Church, and it is a gift to be connected with people all over the world uh, through our denomination. It is a gift, and so as we receive this gift of music, let us now give of our, um, of our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings this very day.
gracious and loving God, bless the gifts that we give now in your name. Help us to know how to best use these gifts for the building up of your kingdom right here among and around us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, please be seated. For those of you who have been following our Lenten journey, uh, which has uh, been entitled Wandering Heart, uh, and it has been about really looking at the story of uh, one of Jesus' most well-known uh, disciples, Peter. Uh, this, this story, uh, this reading from the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John, is really sort of the bookend. Um, if you will think back to uh, when we met Peter, um, back in February at the, the beginning of Lent, Peter was fishing, and they were not catching anything. And Jesus showed up and showed them how to do a new thing in fishing. So let us listen now. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this Way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter Thomas, called the twin Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to the group, I am going fishing, and they said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And he said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were able to haul it in because there were so many fish. Sound familiar, right? That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, come beloveds and have some breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, then feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, then feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten to your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten your belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, 
Come and follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Good morning. I just wanted to make sure people weren't asleep. It sounds like you are, so let's try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. It is my pleasure and honor to be here, not only as your executive conference minister, but also as a member of Asylum Hill. I did tell Pastor Erica that this is my last official visit, and hopefully the rest of the time I can just be Darrell when I come. <laughs> so we'll get all of the perfunctory things out today so that you just welcome me the next Sunday as a member of this community. Join me in prayer. Heard of all things, we trust that you will send a word of renewal of life, a word that will strengthen us and stretch us. These things we trust you for. Amen. There's a little song that was on my heart in relation to this sermon. So just, if you want to close your eyes or hold a meditative space, listen to these words. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. Walk with me, Lord, walk with me, while I'm on this tedious journey, I want Jesus to walk with me, be my friend, Lord, be my friend. Be my friend, Lord, be my friend, while I'm on this tedious journey, I want Jesus to be my friend. My siblings, we are walking on a journey. And if we pay attention to the societal tapes of that journey, it seems as if we are meant to walk that journey alone. If we pay attention to the way we're socialized, we are supposed to walk that journey with individual chutzpah and energy. You are rewarded, you are celebrated if you can say, I am independent, I am strong, I am universally by myself, and hear me roar. But somehow that narrative and that tape seems to be incongruent with our faith. The sermon topic I've offered to you today is, you can't fish alone. As soon as I texted pastor that title, I immediately heard my own voice say, but you can fish alone. <laughs> you can actually do it by yourself. The people are gonna see this and go, what is he talking about? I categorically know you can fish alone. I thought about it in my own experience. I have never fished alone, and I don't actually know how to fish anything about it. I can't tell you about tackle or bait or whatever that thing that you put, I can't give you any information. The last time I was go uh, the last time I went fishing was at nine years old when my great uncle came to visit Chicago from Mississippi. And he found out that there was a water body near our house in the inner city of Chicago, and he decided that he was going to go fishing and declared that I was going to go with him. My nine-year-old brain growing up in an urban environment was categorically confused. Fish comes from the grocery store, not from some dirty water in the city of Chicago. But somehow he was clear that he and I were going to go fishing. He found a stick, somehow found some line, and then we were going fishing, and I was looking at my mom like, rescue me. Something does not make sense here. We found ourselves on top of some form of an overpass, and I watched this man who I believed had completely lost his mind throw out this line to fish. My friends, that day we didn't catch 
any fish, which in my nine-year-old self, I realized I don't think the fish you want from Mississippi are swimming around in Chicago, <laughs> but whatever. I went home somewhat frustrated, still delusionally confused, and not exactly sure what just happened. If I look at that from this point to that nine-year-old boy, my great uncle was teaching me that you can't fish alone. He was teaching me that even if something made sense from his perspective and it didn't make sense for mine, we could still do the journey together. You see, I was very focused on that you can't catch fish in the middle of the city of Chicago, and my great uncle was very much consumed with, I want to spend some time with my great nephew. You see, our perspective colored what the experience meant. In this gospel passage, you have a group of people who know how to fish. It is their livelihood. It is the way in which they have moved through the world, and they throw out their nets, and then nothing is caught. And then somehow Jesus encourages another try, and the nets are filled. You see, it wasn't that they didn't know what they were doing. It took also the connection to Jesus for the nets to be filled. Not only were the nets filled, but pay attention to the story. The fire and some fish was already being prepared for them. You see, it wasn't even that they had to catch all the fish and do all the work while Jesus just basically said, yeah, over there, to the left, oh, maybe to the right, oh, too bad you didn't do it. But Jesus was already preparing a place for them, but also asking them, what might you contribute to the party? My friends, we are living in a world where people just want to get the invitation to contribute to the party. And we're so busy making all the plans to the party by ourselves, assuming that it is somehow our birthright, our God-given responsibility to do it all alone, and we're forgetting that there are some people who just want to walk on the journey with you. I am convinced you cannot fish alone. We have this understanding that somehow independence is holy. But as I heard recently, independence is actually a trauma response. It's what we do to shield ourselves so that we are no longer disappointed by those who have, quote, let us down. And so we are going to fortify ourselves to make sure what happened to me then will never happen to me again. I will do it on my own. But if we're real honest, everything that we do in this world in some ways is interdependent. Everything we're experiencing right now, other folks have somehow contributed to its being. All this week, there were people rehearsing and practicing. All this week, someone was getting a bulletin together. All this week, someone else was praying that you might have an experience today that could be transformative. And then, over 50 and 70 years ago, someone else was praying that this church might be in existence. I'm aware that even standing in this place in October of 2022 to be married was because there were a history of people before Kenny and I ever got here that did their work so that Asylum Hill might welcome two black men to get married in this place. It was about interdependence. Not an individual feat. I didn't come one day and declare as the conference minister it would be so, and then all things moved, and therefore the welcome was there. Somebody else had laid the foundation and opened up the way. Because we are universally connected in ways that we're being taught every day to ignore. We talk about loneliness. We talk about isolation. And yet we are living in a community in a context that continually teaches us to reinforce it, to perpetuate it, and to somehow tell ourselves it's good. 
My invitation to you on this holy day after resurrection is to just like Jesus did, wake up. Wake up and find where is your work to counter this culture of independence and proclaim the culture of interdependence. Someone said to us recently that if you think about indigenous communities and other cultures around the world, their ancestors, their complete reality of generations are presently working on their behalf. And in North America, our ancestors are woefully unemployed. We are not thinking about a community that extends beyond ourselves. We're not thinking about those in the front and the back and to the left and the right of us. We are thinking about how do I survive? But what if the Holy Spirit wanted you to thrive? What if the Holy Spirit wanted you to not fish alone? Next door to us, and I perfectly they don't watch this, next door to our house are some more UCC people. Congregational members. We fellowship, we talk to them, but my God, a couple of weeks ago, they decided that they were gonna cut down all the trees between our house and their house. They didn't call us, they didn't text us, they didn't quote, ask our permission to do something on their property, but I was woefully distressed when those trees went down. And I was trying to you know, balance my role because I'm like your neighbor, I'm like your conference minister calling you to say, God bless you, what are you doing next door? I found a gentle way to ask by just saying, I'm checking in and I hope you're well. I see you're doing some things. Would you like to express what was happening? They said, oh, look, we had to clean that up. I think they accidentally cut more than we were expecting. And like, I'm sorry about the disturbance and so on and so forth. I got off the phone, blessed her on her way, and immediately told Kenny, we need to call about putting up a fence. These are the same neighbors that we've invited to sup at our table. The same neighbors who showed up with a cake on our first day of arrival. The same neighbors who, even though they live next door, still mail the Christmas cards so that they can come freshly with postage. But because we are rugged individualists and in this place of New England, because they cut down those trees, then we must build a fence. Because how dare we be connected in a way that there wasn't the block that the trees We cannot fish alone. When we think about the promulgation of the gospel, the extravagant welcome of this place, there is someone outside of these walls who is woefully alone, maybe at least in their mind, definitely in the heart, and it feels that way. But if I were to do the number count of everyone in this room, if every one of us committed to fighting that independence, discovering how we were inter interdependent, and reaching out to say, you do not have to fish alone, imagine the lives we might collectively change. Now I end by saying it's easy to think about the people outside of the walls, right? I said that and you maybe thought, yes, I do know someone, and that's helpful, and I will go and do the work. What if I told you that some of those people are sitting right next to you? Right in front of you, right beside you. If we're really gonna be church, what if I was honest and said some of those people are you? It is our work together to be the healing handiwork of God on the earth. It is not just for us to celebrate that somehow Jesus rose and so all the work is done. Jesus is also telling you to get up to. When we do that, we will do this transformative ministry called church. Jesus won't have to ask the question, do you love me? And we won't have to get frustrated like Peter. Obviously, I love you. I could be doing brunch right now, but I'm in this church. No, we would say, I love you because I saw my sibling thinking they had to be independent all by themselves. And I walked over and said, I struggle with that sometimes too. But what if we tried to be interdependent with one another? What if you didn't have to fish alone and I didn't have to fish alone? And somehow we put our lines together. And even if you caught the big fish and I caught nothing, I'm gonna believe God that there's enough to feed me, you, and then the other friend we didn't even know was on the way. Walk with 
me, Lord. Walk with me. Be my friend, Lord. Be my friend. While I'm on this tedious journey, I want Jesus and some of y'all to walk with me. Amen.
Friends, for the last seven weeks, we have been following the life and faith of Peter. Despite being one of Jesus' most loyal disciples, Peter still made mistakes. He was faithful and messy, humble and afraid, loving and cautious. And friends, each one of us is a lot like Peter. Despite our faith, we too make mistakes. Despite our belief, we too carry unbelief. Despite our love, we can cause hurt. So like Peter, let us return now together to God in prayer, confessing the truth of our lives. God's grace does not stop with that humble yet fearful disciple. Beloveds, God's grace reaches all the way to us. So let us pray together. Gracious God, like Peter, we crawl out of the boat only to sink. You tell us the truth and we push it away. We ask about forgiveness and are surprised by abundance. We profess our faith and deny it three times. We run to the empty tomb and leave in silence. Over and over again, we find ourselves wandering along the journey of faith. Tether us to your heart. Forgive our surprise, our denial, and our limited imagination. Call us out of the boat once more. We are eager to return to you. With humble hearts we pray, amen. Friends, the first time that Peter saw Jesus after the crucifixion, Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? This repetition was not because Jesus doubted Peter's word. This repetition was Jesus offering Peter grace. You see, the last time Jesus and Peter were together, Peter said three times, I do not know that man. So when Jesus returned, he asked Peter, do you love me? And in that moment, he allowed Peter to turn his denials into love. Friends, the grace of our God knows absolutely no end. When we stumble, when we fall, when we deny God or cause harm, Jesus meets us where we are and offers us a second chance. So rest in the good news. Does God love you? Yes. 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 God loves you. We are, for, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God for a love that indeed never ends. One of the first things that Jesus did after the resurrection was feed his disciples. The Gospel of John tells us that it was on a beach fire. Bread and fish cooked over an open flame. Immediately, the disciples knew it was Jesus because Jesus was feeding his people. Jesus was always telling the left out and the ignored, the hurting and the hungry, the sick and the hopeful, I have a seat saved just for you. Friends, that is why we come to this table 2,000 years later. We come to remember. We come to be close. We come to get a taste of the kingdom of God. So come. Come, those of you who are seeking. Come, those of you who are hungry. Come with your wandering heart and your fickle faith and know that Christ has saved a seat at this table just for you. Christ always has a seat saved for you, and nothing, nothing can change that. Friends, this is indeed the joyful feast of our God. 
for you. Beloveds, the bread is indeed broken this morning, and the cup is indeed filled with abundance. Let us come. Let us come and taste and see God's love and grace. Here at Asylum Hill Congregational Church, our table is open to all, full stop, all who come seeking that love and that grace. I want to let you know that today our Faith Lab students are here to experience that faith, that love, and that grace with us. We will take communion by intinction. We ask that you find one of the, one of the folks nearest to you who will have the bread and the cup that you would take the bread, dip it into the cup, and receive God's love. Come, all is
my siblings. For our prayer of thanksgiving, I want you to repeat these words after me. I, I am a vessel, a vessel full, full of, spirit of spirit and power. And power. I want you to think about a sibling in this room right now, and I want you to say these words. You, you are, are a vessel, a vessel full, full of, spirit of spirit and power. And, power. and then lastly, we, we are, are vessels, vessels full, full of, spirit of spirit and power. And power. Alleluia and amen. today remembering that indeed we are vessels full of spirit and power and let us be reminded that we never ever have to go fishing alone for we are always in the presence of God with Jesus the resurrected one and in the spirit and we have one another amen amen Yeah. <laughs>